Eastward they must sail, but ever west their hearts returned. Now this yearning grew ever greater with the years, and the Numenorians began to hunger for the undying city that they saw from afar, and the desire of everlasting life, to escape from death and the ending of delight, grew strong upon them, and ever as their power and glory grew greater, their unquiet increased. For though the Valar had rewarded the Dúnedain with long life, they could not take from them the weariness of the world that comes at last. And they died, even their kings of the seed of Earendil, and the span of their lives was brief in the eyes of the Eldar. Thus it was that a shadow fell upon them, in which maybe the will of Morgoth was at work, but still moved in a world. Greetings and well met, my friends. Yoisten here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today, our timeline of Arda takes us to the dark years of men and the darkening of Numenor, through its downfall as we continue to progress through the Second Age. If you are new to the series, please check out the timeline of Arda leading up to this point. I have a playlist with all of this series in order. There will be some videos and articles in the description that helped with this video as well, and that expand on the ideas presented forthwith. My friends, thank you all for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. Now we'll pick up where we left off in the last episode. After the creation of the One Ring to rule all other rings of power, sometime around the year 1600 of the Second Age, the elves knew that they had been deceived, for Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, was Sauron, the greatest lieutenant of Morgoth the enemy. Sauron's plans with his rings of power, however, failed also, for the elves had crafted three of their own design, but still with the knowledge given to them by Sauron. Sauron was enraged by this. What's more, the sixteen other rings, nine of which would go to men and seven that would go to the dwarves, were still in Aregion, with Celebrimbor, the lord of the Noldoran smiths, and the other, Gwaith I Myrdain. Or, if the story of the dwarves is to be believed, Durin III had, or would receive his ring before Sauron's invasion. And indeed, Sauron and his plans were revealed to the elves, and a great malice came over him, and so, in Mordor, he prepared for war. Thus he began his preparations for war, and around that same time, Glorfindel and perhaps the two blue wizards came into Middle-earth. In 1693, the War of the Elves and Sauron began, concerning which I go into greater detail in another video on the matter, but I shall summarize the war for our purposes here. It was during that year that the three elven rings were hidden with the guardians Gilgalad, possibly Círdan at that point, and Galadriel. Sauron first made his assault on Aregion and the Gwaithai Myrdain in 1695, and the forces of Celeborn were turned aside, even as the army of Elrond made their way there from Linden at King Gilgalad's command. At that time, King Gilgalad also sent word to Numenor for aid. But Sauron's fury came too swiftly and with too much might. Aregion was sacked, Celebrimbor tortured and slain, and the sixteen lesser rings recovered. Elrond and Celeborn were driven into the north together, making it to a hidden valley where they withstood a great siege, and they would establish Imladris in 1697, even as the elves of Lothlorien and dwarves of Casadum were pushed back behind the doors of Durin. Sauron and his forces overran Eriador, and as the Dark Lord made ready to destroy Linden and break Gilgalad's realm, taking two of the elven rings, a great many ships arrived out of the west. Tar Minister of Numenor had sent his great navy and had finally arrived in 1700. They finally saw the shadow that Tar Eldarion knew was coming, and had reported from Gilgalad to his father and people of. Indeed, it was Tar Eldarion's friendship with the elves and foresight of the shadow to come that aided in the defeat of Sauron during this war. Numenorians from the northwest joined High King Gilgalad and his elves in pushing Sauron back, while others, stationed at Vinyalande or Lond Dyer, a refuge made by Tar Eldarion, aided in routing Sauron. And so, in 1701, Sauron was driven out of Eriador, his conquest a failure. He barely escaped the wrath of the first and second-born children of Eru, but though he had always hated the firstborn, the elves, his animosity with the Numenorians, the descendants of Barahir and Baron, whom of old he hated, only grew. He went back to Mordor, awaiting the time when he might get revenge upon them. In the meantime, Rivendell was established as the new seat of Gilgalad's new vice-regent, Elrond, and the stronghold of the elves in northeastern Eriador, for Celebrimbor's realm of Aregion was crushed. Vilja, Gilgalad's ring, would also go to Elrond at around that time in secret. The first White Council would be held, Galadriel and Celeborn would reunite before going south, and Elrond would meet his future wife Celebrian, the daughter of Galadriel and Celeborn as well. 
There was peace in the West for a time, and Numenor continued its expansion, after having tasted power in Middle-earth, and they would begin making permanent settlements in Middle-earth around the year 1800. Ever during their interactions with the men of Middle-earth, the Numenorians, when they were not feared and hidden from, were seen by the Middlemen as great sea kings, and even gods. But the Numenorians had always returned west, but then they began constructing those permanent places in Middle-earth. In Numenor itself, the shadow also began to fall. Throughout its history, elves, Iru, and even death were regarded with wisdom and respect in Numenor. They upheld the ban of the Valar, for though they could see the undying lands to the west, it was there they could not sail, and centuries passed, and with it wisdom. Men, as it often is a vice with our kindred, wanted what they could not have. They forgot the lessons of their fathers, and found fear in the unknown, lusting for things they did not understand, and having hatred for the only guarantee in the lives of men, death. No amount of land or power in Middle-earth could quench those vices, nor the desire for unending life, and the jealousy such men had for elves who possessed immortality. The gift of men was then seen as a curse to many. During the reigns of Tar Kiryatan and Tar Atanamir, the great wisdom of old Numenor fell into question, and these kings were greedy men, who levied tribute on their colonies in Middle-earth. They took more than they gave. During Tar Atanamir's reign, which began in 2251, messengers from Valinor came to Tar Atanamir to deliver the mind of Manwe, who saw the shadow fall upon Numenor and was grieved. The men sought above their station, they sought immortality, and the elven messengers attempted to explain why Numenorian immortality could not be so, and to help the Numenorians understand their place in the world and in the mind of Iru, of whose wisdom concerning the death of men was unknown to the Valar. But the Numenorians would not accept this, not from those who were deathless themselves and were subject to mannish envy. At least, not all of the Numenorians would accept this. Division rose in Numenor between Tar Atanamir's group, the King's Men, who rejected the wisdom of the Valar and Eldar, and sought beyond their mortality, and the Elendili, the elf friends, the faithful, who dwelt in western Numenor, descended from Silmarion and the lords of Andunie. They wished to heed the Valar and Eldar, and to keep friendship with them, and to keep wisdom, but even they were affected by the fear of death. The king's men associated less with elves and their wisdom, coming more to the southern and eastern lands in Middle-earth, while the faithful continued to visit the north and west of Middle-earth, as well as Gilgalad and his elves. Sauron, who yet dwelt in Middle-earth throughout all of this time, spreading his influence and domination in the south and east during the dark days of men, must also have known about the division and shadow upon Numenor, for he gave three rings to the Numenorians, and in that time, 2251, the Nazgul began to appear in Middle-earth, and indeed, three of them were Numenorians. But Numenor, despite its internal problems, continued its expansion, being yet afraid of the Valar, even if they loved them not, building Umbar into a great fortress of the King's Men of Numenor in 2280, and Pelargir in 2350, which became the chief haven of the faithful Numenorians in Middle-earth. If the Numenorians couldn't rule the west, they would rule the east. The three prayers to Iru were ended after the days of Tar and Kalamon, and the elven tongue was used less and less. The Eldar visited Numenor less as well, or would only do so in secret. There finally came a king Ar Adunachor, in 2899, when the kingly tradition of taking names in Quenya was abandoned, and the language of Andunach of Numenor became the new tradition. Ar Adunachor, the Lord of the West, was a name that seemed to challenge the true Lord of the West, the Elder King, Manwe. The elven tongues were outlawed in the presence of Ar Adunachor, and he openly persecuted the faithful. Ar Gimelzor would follow in this fashion, moving many of the faithful to the eastern parts of Numenor so they could be watched, or so they could leave the island to go to their elven friends in Middle-earth, never to return. The elves came no more out of the west to Numenor, but Ar Gimelzor's son, who he had with the Lady in Zilbeth, was Tar Palantir, who followed his mother's policies and ideals, which were secretly those of the faithful. Tar Palantir would repent for his people, taking his Quenya name, for he was an elf friend, and he would observe the ancient religious ceremonies of Numenor, and he would tend to the White Tree, for he was the far-sighted, and knew that if the White Tree perished, so too would the line of the kings of Numenor. 
But his people were far too deluded, and his actions were met with rebellion, for his younger brother Gimilchad and nephew Arpharazon were more like Tarpalantir's father, and they were with the king's men. Tarpalantir alone could not save his people, and the sight of Tol Arisea in the west was even withheld from him, and no elven ships visited as they did in the days before the darkening. Civil war even broke out during his reign. His daughter Tar Miriel would be usurped by her first cousin and forced husband, Arpharazon. Arpharazon the Golden, the last king of Numenor, took power in 3255, and Sauron would eventually emerge again, calling himself the King of Men among many other titles, for he had indeed dominated the men of the south and east, thus irking the Numenorians who set out against him. Arpharazon and his folk landed at Umbar, and in 3262, the strength of the Numenorians could not be overcome by Sauron directly, so Sauron surrendered and was taken prisoner. He would destroy them from the inside out, having his revenge against them for his humiliating defeat in the War of the Elves and Sauron. So, from 3262 to 3310, Sauron rose from prisoner to the greatest advisor of the king. It is clear Numenor was failing anyway, so he was only a hastener of fate likely taking a fair guise like he did when he was Anatar and seducing the king's men to evil. The White Tree was destroyed, and a temple to Melkor was created, wherein human sacrifices to the original Dark Lord were made. He even convinced Arpharazon to make a great armament, which began in 3310 to assail Valinor and to take immortality and lordship for their own. Of course, they could not do this, and surely Sauron knew of the strength of the Valar from the War of Wrath and before but he purely sought the downfall of Numenor. This he would have, for even after a warning in the image of a great eagle cloud from the west, and the sailing of Amandil, the father of Elendil, into the west to warn and get help from the Valar, the great armament led by Arpharazon set out to assail Valinor in 3319 of the Second Age, and the downfall began. Arpharazon and his men were buried beneath the earth on the shores of Amman, as the world was reshaped and Numenor met a cataclysm. Eru himself never intervened much in the events of Middle-earth, but he brought the downfall of Numenor and the reshaping of the world which, in some versions of the Legendarium, made the world round instead of flat after that point in time. Sauron had victory, even as his body drowned with Numenor, but his spirit endured and returned to Mordor, even though he could never take a false and fair guise again and was weakened. But he was not the only survivor of Numenor. Elendil and his sons, Isildur and Denarion, the descendants of the lords of Andunie, had made ready to sail from Romena at Amandil's request, and they escaped the utter havoc being wrought by Eru, god, on their homeland. They brought with them many fair and great things, such as Narsil, the Palantiri, the Ring of Barahir, and a sapling of the White Tree, saved by Isildur, among other things. Just as the lineage of the White Tree would go on, the lineage of Elros through the line of Elendil would survive as well. A western wind brought the faithful to Middle-earth, while Numenor sank beneath the sea. And that is where we will end today's episode of the Timeline of Arda. From this part of the Timeline of Arda and the darkening of Numenor, we see that tradition, friendship, and love must never be abandoned, and should always be taught from parent to child. Furthermore, we see that we must not forsake wisdom, not for any fear not even for the fear of death. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this episode of the Timeline of Arda. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about this part of the timeline? Let me know in the comments below. For me, while this is most definitely a sad aspect of the history of Arda, and it shows vices of humanity, it depicts also the strength and wisdom and trust that the wisest characters throughout the history of Middle-earth have. For we see what happens to characters who don't have such wisdom in this part of the history. To further support the channel, please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for our podcast and Discord server. All of those links are in the description below. I want to shout out our Valar tier patrons, Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putin, and Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, and Tobias Goldner, Ryan Ramsey, Adam Rank, Merton, and our newest Valar tier patron, John Hume. Thank you guys so much, it means so much to me. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a new What's Different video beginning the return of the king. Everyone, Happy New Year, and thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.